faithfully pass on to faithful men and women the message of God's word so that in turn they could tell other people so your kingdom could advance. That's why we're here, Lord. So speak to us and lead us here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, we do have a a monumental task, and we might not be able to speak of of the people in uh, Turkey or in Germany right now, but somehow, some way, we can connect with everyone on this planet. We're going to talk about that for the next year or so. Hi, Marty. (laughs) You trying to sneak in? Hey, Jay. What's up, brother? Hi, Mac. Woof. <laughs> so listen, we got a job to do. We got a job to do. Um, I, uh, I was thinking the other day, you know, we have these stickers for our cars. This is super hot up here. Um, we have these stickers for our cars, and I don't know if, if, it's, if it's just this church, you know, but anytime I see a, a sticker for a church, it's, um, it makes me, it's thought-provoking, it just kind of makes me stop and think about Jesus, whether it's this church or any other in town or anywhere I'm visiting. If I see a church sticker, it makes you think about Jesus just for a second, you know? And, and so I, I just want to offer that to you. We're going to be studying the book of Acts where the gospel spreads across the earth, and we all have a, a part to play in that. And so I was just thinking, you know, this is kind of shallow, but hey, why don't we have one of these on everyone's car, right? What, what, do you think this is a message that, that everyone in this world needs to see? Everyone needs to know that they're loved, right? So who, who wants one for their car? You need one for your car? Awesome. You need one for your car. You, Cece, you, you got a sign in your car. You, you, don't, you don't need one of these, right? She, 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 she's the best ch- church member here, even though we don't have members. She has a sign in her window. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there, you know? What am I giving it to you for? You're going to make me put it on. <laughs> Huh? Right? You need one too. Yeah. You need one. Man, just, just to let people know, right? They're going down the road and they're having a rough day, right? They just need to know that, that somebody loves them, right? We do. God does, you know? So I think it's a, it's a good idea. We should just have them on our cars. Can I ask you yeah. About yeah. Love? Yes. Yes. Um, Yeah, see, little thing like you just never know, right? You just never know with that little message. It's just something that someone needs right in that time when they're fighting with their spouse, their kids are driving them crazy, they just got fired from a job, whatever it is, right? And they just need to know. They need to know that they're loved. So let's slap those things on our cars and let the world know, all right? Um, hey, um, just, just some, some, some good news. I know that you guys uh, probably all, if, you, if you're not on Facebook, um, we do have a Facebook page, and we kind of announced it's super hot back here. Um, it's coming in on me. Maybe it's the sub or something. I don't know what it is, but super loud. Um, but if you're not on Facebook, um, or if you're on and you, don't, you haven't liked the church's page, just do that. It's the, guess what? It's the red and white loved logo. That, that's the giveaway, right? But we announce stuff on there. But I don't know if you guys all already know. Maybe you don't, but... Um, Jerome and Amara, they had, uh, Amara had her baby the other day. I uh, wasn't expected that day, but there was some complications, and so the doctor said, nope, in the room right now, C-section, let's do this right now. Uh, baby came out, heartbeat was kind of low and not really loud, and so they're kind of worried about that, so baby came out, baby wasn't breathing, um, had an ear lift from Leesburg to Winnie Palmer, and, um, it was really touch and go. Like, they, they got a phone call from the doctor you'd never want to hear. 
Um, but as of today, she's doing so much better. Little Emery is doing so much better. She start, she's breathing on her own, and she was having seizures and stuff, so those have uh, slowed all, or maybe even stopped at this point, you know? So we got a grandma over here who's, like, breathing again, so that's good. And um, so seizures have stopped, breathing on her own, um, starting to get some color to her body, and her eyes open today. We got a picture of her open eyes, which was just adorable. She's just a sweet little thing, so she's doing much better. Um, we were able to go up. Meredith and I got to go up there yesterday and see the baby, and I got to I got to kiss the littlest piggies I think I've ever kissed in my life. It was really cool. They're, they were purple, too. Cute little purple piggies. There's nothing tastier in the world than little purple piggies, man, I'm telling you. But anyway, they, they will, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll see them uh, soon, and probably baby, probably, baby will probably have to be there for probably a couple of weeks even. Who knows? Uh, we don't know. Yeah, two weeks, that's cool, but who knows what will happen, but uh, just keep praying for little baby Emery, and I will say this, that mom and dad have been absolute rocks. I mean, they have, they have a great attitude, they've been believing that, that the Lord was going to heal their baby, and, and he has, and... It's just been great, so uh, I can't wait to welcome them back here. I'm sure that they would love your hugs and, and covet your prayers, so keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, all right? Um, all right, so I've been waiting for a while to say this, so I'm super excited to say it. You ready? Open your Bible to the book of Acts. Open your Bible to the book of Acts. Uh, yeah, it's going to be great. We're gonna, it's going to take a long time to go through this, man, 28 chapters of total awesomeness, and uh, last time we preached through a, a big book like this, it was Luke. Um, this is his second book, but the first book, Luke, it took us well over a year, and, and this will, no doubt, as well. Um, I'm not going to do it like constant all the way through, you know. There'll be breaks along the way, and we have, you know, Christmas will come, and Easter will come, and I'll have those weeks that I won't be here, and, and Pastor Jay will be up, or who knows, maybe we'll get John Abner to come back. He said he'd love to come back anytime, so that was cool. He, he, was, he was great this, this past week, wasn't he? He's just an awesome, awesome guy. Got to have lunch with him on Friday, and um, it was a good time. Uh, he's just a wonderful man. I love him. So anyway, um, while you're opening up to the book of Acts, I just got to say, you know, most of you probably already know, you know, I grew up Jewish, and so um, I, I, I didn't really read the Bible. I went to temple you know, and, I, and I knew there was a God, and, and, and uh, I knew some of those famous Bible characters, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and of course, Moses and, and King David and then Goliath and Samson and all these famous people. And I knew about the, the feasts and the festivals and the holidays and stuff, and I didn't know anything about Christmas. Y'all had Christmas. I had Hanukkah, and we said Hanukkah, but I know you guys can't say that. So we, we had a little bit different. You were spoiled all around a tree with all these presents, and we got one present a day for a week, and it all added up the same, but, you know, it's not the same. It's not as fun, but I knew about God. I knew there was a God. I knew that there was a creator. I knew there was someone up there, but I didn't really know much about him. I knew, like I said, I knew the festivals and holidays. We went to Sabbath services, you know, but I didn't really even know what that was for, and we lit these candles on Friday night, and I don't even know what those were for. But we did it, but I knew nothing about the God that it was all about. And then several years ago, I, I was introduced to this other part of the Bible. I didn't even know it really existed. It was called the New Testament. And I started to read it, and it blew my mind away, right? I loved it. And it started answering all these questions that I had that, that I never had answers to before. And, and I loved it. And um, it was different. And not, not that it was better, because now having gone back and read the Old Testament now, I realize all of it's incredible, but I, I was amazed by the New Testament. And, and it was transformational for me. And, and it was because it was, um, it was very uh, instructional, like it, 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 it taught me some stuff on how to live and gave me some answers to questions that I have. It was also very relational, right? Here and here. It taught us, it teaches me how to relate to this one that I didn't really know about. I just knew that he was. And it helped me to relate with you guys too, with people. And so it was very inspirational and very, listen, this is why it was inspirational and transformational. is because it was very practical. 
I, I don't know about you, but I don't need high and mighty stories, right? I've never had a burning bush talk to me, right? I've never had that. I, I need someone to come up to me and say, listen, dude, don't do that. That's what I needed. And I found that all in the New Testament. Amazing. 27 letters, what you want to call them, books, whatever, of, of total amazingness. And the main character is God himself, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, which I wasn't allowed to learn about. And so when all of a sudden the second person of the Trinity, the one that the Bible attri actually attributes creation to, that when, when, when he spoke and the planets came into existence, the book of Colossians says that it was actually Jesus who said it. And all of a sudden now I'm introduced to him <coughs> in 27 books. And it blew my mind. I suggest that you read it. I think that you'll like it. I was encouraged a little while ago, I went outside in the lobby, and your kids, who are not in here, though, it's kind of bummed me out, right? They were sitting out there reading the Bible. Not a word. They both had their Bibles open, just like that. I said, there'll be a test later, and they just looked at me. I said, just kidding. But, man, it's, a, it's an awesome book. It's a, an awesome section of the Bible that I think that you should read, 27 books, um, the New Testament is kind of divided up, as, as far as I can see it, into like three different parts. There's the part where like Jesus is born, <coughs> and he lives, and what he said, and what he did, and where he went, and who he is. And then we're introduced to his whole, this whole Passion Week, they call it, where he actually goes to the cross and dies for sin. And, and then he's buried, and then he resurrects, he, he comes up out of the grave, man. And, and then he ascends to heaven. And most of that stuff is found in the first four books of the New Testament. The Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then, the this, this second part of the New Testament, it's the church part. It's... This is kind of skipping ahead, but I want you to see something in the book of Acts. You turn there. I want you to see. Um, look here at chapter 1, verse 9. This is the second part of the, of the New Testament. It's this part. After he says some things, Jesus was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. His followers, his disciples, his apostles. And they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Okay, that's the period that we're in. This is the church. This is now. We're, we're, we're in that gap right there between the time he left and the time he'll come back. And I, it's been uh, 2,000 years, and I don't know how many more years it's going to be, whether it's one or another 2,000. I don't know, but we're stuck in that gap. That's where we live right now. And so in, after the Gospels, you go to the book of Acts and all the way down towards the end, like into the book of Jude, just before Revelation, and it's, it's that... It's those instructional books right there where it teaches you about Jesus and how to interact with him and how to live out this church period. This is how we're supposed to live. And then the third part is when Jesus actually does come back. And he sets up his amazing kingdom where he is the exclusive ruler and there's no more bad guys and there's no more bad guy and he's just reigning and ruling and that's his full kingdom and that is mostly told although described in a, a lot of other places but highly concentrated right there in the end of the bible in the book of revelation guess that you read it all but what we're studying here is the book of acts so let's talk a little bit about the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a follow-up letter from this guy Luke who is assumed that he is a doctor of some sort. And he wrote uh, this letter to a man named Theophilus. And it is a follow-up letter to his first letter to Theophilus. And he told, and this, that, his first letter is just, we call it, the Gospel of Luke. 
And he wrote this letter, and in his words, he wrote this to, to Theophilus, so you will know the truth. And so it's this book that tells of Jesus. It's his who and what and where and how. And then Jesus, after that, he ascends to heaven, back to the Father who sent him. And it's from there that Jesus begins to build his kingdom, his church, right? And he said he was going to do that. It's quoted in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not stop it. That's a good place for an amen. And so the book of Acts that we're going to be studying, it picks up this kingdom narrative right there at the ascension of Jesus Christ as he says his final words to his followers. And so that's where I want to start off right here, right now. Are you ready? All right. Let's go Acts chapter 1. Let's just read like the first five verses right here. In my first book, Gospel of Luke, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after his crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. That's big. Talking about, he's preaching a kingdom. He's preaching a kingdom. And that's what he was teaching them. About a kingdom. Once, one time while he was interacting with them within these 40 days, he showed up here and he showed up there. And one of those times, I don't know which time it was, but one of those times, while he was eating with them, he commanded them, right? It's not a suggestion. He commands them this. Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. So he's kind of repeating something he had obviously told them before. We'll talk about that in a minute. Verse 5, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So just for clarity... John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. If you realize that the way you've been living is wrong, you would go down to John in the, into the river and you'd say, I'm sorry, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm living wrong and I want to live for God now, I've been doing it wrong, and he would baptize you. But now this, Jesus said, something is different. Before you were fully immersed in water to show that you just said you were sorry and realized that it was wrong, but now you're going to be fully immersed in something else. And it's the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> as we go through the book of Acts over the next year or so, I'm assuming, there's going to be, along the way, some rabbit trails that we're going to go down. Now, there's a, there's a main narrative that goes consistent through the book of Acts, and then we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But along the way... As we're pursuing that strand and seeing the flow, there's, there's, there's things that happen and things we see where we need to pause and just go down that rabbit trail because there's good teaching down there, okay? And it might not have everything to do, like, particularly with that main subject, but it's valid and true and helpful and we need to pursue it. I made a commitment a long time ago that when I began to preach if I saw something in Scripture that was glaringly true, but it opposed a lot of teaching that is commonly taught in churches, I would pause there and I would, I would, I would do my best to explain what it says because we need to understand the truth, okay? We need to understand the truth. Now, here's one here I want to mention to you. I think it's super, super important. I need a drink. <clears throat> my throat's dry. Super, super important. There are times, there were times <clears throat> in biblical history when people, before the crucifixion of Jesus occurred, okay, before the crucifixion of Jesus occurred, when they were indwelled or filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people teach that it is a New Testament only reality, that it is a um, post 
ascension after he rises from the grave, hangs out with them for 40 days, and then he ascends to heaven, that, that being indwelled or filled with the Holy Spirit is a after that, a post-ascension reality, and that is not true. Okay? It's commonly taught that back in the old, like before Jesus died and resurrected, and ascended, that the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody, but now it's different because now he indwells us and fills us, and so it's a different situation. I'm going to tell you that that is not true in any way, shape, or form, and I hope that right now you're saying, preacher better show me some scripture, because I don't necessarily believe what he's saying, and I will just say that I am going to show you that, and it's super, super important that you know this. Because John 4.24 says that we're supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth, right? In spirit and in truth. And so I could tell you, hey, you should worship Jesus. And you'd all say, amen, right? Yeah, yeah of course, right? And, and, but, but, but what if I preach to you uh, that, 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 that the Lord is, is grace upon grace and love and love and love and love and every week you come and it's about love and I never share with you the part about his justice or maybe you come to this church and every week I preach about his justice you know because you can't mock the justice of God you know that right what you sow finish my sentence right you reap right so so it, but that does that ex do we, do we preach that and preach that and exclude the grace that's given to you that even though you're wretched and rotten and make these mistakes, that he still saved you because he's awesome? That's grace, right? There's grace there. You mess up and he says, it's okay. Not okay, but I'll let you in anyway because of what I did. That's grace. Grace says you get another chance even after you screw up, but his justice says, I love you. I'll let you in, but you're going to get a spanking because you did something wrong. And so you're going to be disciplined by the Father. We all, nobody likes to be taken out to the woodshed by the Lord, right? It's not much fun. Hmm. <clears throat> I got the story today. Good story. Maybe he'll testify later another time if he wants to. But it was a, it was a bit of a, it wasn't a spanking. He didn't get the belt, but he got a spanking. We all get spankings, right? So, so what I'm saying is that there's, there's a fullness of who God is, right? And if you, if you exclude any part of his character and you don't talk of all of his attributes, then you could say, hey, you should worship Jesus. But if it's not the real, complete Jesus, then you ain't worshiping him at all. So you have to worship him with spirit and truth. Like you get excited about it and say, woo, let's get fired up about Jesus, right? But if it ain't the right Jesus, you ain't worshiping nobody. <clears throat> we're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. And uh, God's, let me just say this. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and, and listen, his word is true. His word doesn't change. He doesn't change. The Bible is one book telling one story about one God. It's not an Old Testament God over here who's full of wrath and justice and smiting. And then over here, it's soft serve and grace and love and everything's fine and liberty and justice for all or something. I don't know, right? It's, it's not like that. You have to understand, I am the Lord. I do not change. Okay? I do not change. So, here, you ready? People living before Jesus died and rose again were filled and indwelled, not just came upon by the Holy Spirit. You ready? Um, Numbers 27, 18. Can you get any older than that? Numbers, Numbers, the book nobody wants to read. Numbers 27, 18, it says this of Joshua, that he has the Holy Spirit in him. Didn't come upon him for a certain act of, of bravery. No, 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 no. Moses, go get Joshua. He has, this, he has my spirit in him. He's just walking along, doing his thing. Joshua's just going through life, right? And as he's walking along, he has the Spirit in him. Not upon him, in him, indwelling. How about this one? I love this one. A little bit different wording, but you'll see it. This is awesome, right? Um, Judges 6, 34, it says that the Spirit of the Lord 
took possession of Gideon. Took possession of Gideon. Listen, I don't want to talk about demons and, and ugly, right? But listen, when, when someone is being completely like filled with a demon and it's controlling what they do, what do we say? When he's totally filled with this thing where it's not me anymore talking, it's the demon talking. What do we say? Possessed, right? But yet somehow our mature Christian experts won't see this as the same thing but with God, right? If Gideon is possessed by God, right, Talk about ownership. Talk about being controlled by someone other than yourself, right? How much control is left for Gideon when you're possessed by the Lord? None, right? Is he, is he indwelled? Is he filled? I say so. How about this? Not, not Old Testament, but pre-death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. You ready? Luke chapter 1, verse 41 John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, his mom, her name is Elizabeth. In 141, it says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Fill, this is quoting. I'm quoting. I'm not making anything up. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And just a few verses later in 167, John's dad, not to be outdone, right, his name is Zechariah, and it says, quote, was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. Listen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gifted with a spiritual gift, and exercising it pre-Jesus being born. Okay? So, just a correction in your theology. It's important that you know these things because a more educated Christian is a better worshiper, right? You can get more fired up in the spirit woo, when you know the truth, right? So add that to the truth pile. So the Holy Spirit being in God's people, it's not a new thing. It's not a post-ascension thing. It's not a new thing at all. But what is new is that instead of a, like a person here, and then maybe over in another town over there, maybe there's another person over there. And then in this other country, maybe, maybe Sean's got it over there, but, but these guys don't. Maybe, maybe instead of that, the new thing is that the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out onto the masses of people as Jesus Christ begins to build his church. That's new. That's different. And this... This, this, this prophecy of this outpouring was declared in the book of Joel hundreds and hundreds of years before this is taking place with Jesus Christ. And you don't need to turn there, but it's Joel 2, 28 and 29. The reason why I say don't even have to turn there is because <coughs> this prophetic word is quoted by Peter in the second chapter of the book of Acts, you can turn one page and you can read it. He quotes the prophet Joel and he says this, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants men and women alike, and they will prophesy. So, here's just a little bit more teaching. Christians jump to conclusions. Different denominations jump to conclusions. It, does it say that he's going to pour out his spirit on all people? It says that, right? You read it. I read it. I read it out loud. You see it in your Bible because I know you have one in front of you. But does that mean that he's going to pour it out on all people? There's 7 billion people on this earth. <clears throat> Well, this is why we study the Word of God. We don't just rip open the Bible and do our little morning, morning devotional. Almost caught a Boston accent right there. Did you see that? Did you hear it? Don't do a morning. Don't do it. That was for Cece. Don't do a morning devotional, right? You, crack, you, you open up your Bible, you get a pen out, you get a notebook, you get a concordance, right? You figure out what's going on here. All is the Greek word pas. And it can mean all. It can definitely mean all. It can also mean every. Okay? Starting to be a big number right there, right? But as many words do in our language and in Greek and in Hebrew, there's different definitions for single words, right? 
So the conclusion is to jump to all. And that means everybody's going to do it. Everybody's going to have visions, and everyone's going to have dreams, and everyone's going to speak in tongues, and everybody's going to do that. Everybody's going to do it because they're going to pour out my spirit on all people. Except the word pas also means any. It means thoroughly. It means, uh, how about this? Whosoever. Does that sound familiar? Whosoever. That's in a famous verse, isn't it? John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Whosoever believes or believeth, right, whosoever. Does that mean everyone? Does that mean all people are going to believe in him? No, it means the ones who decide to, they will, right? And so could it mean that here? Same word, right? Could be. Uh, it also means all manner of means. It means I'm going to do it in different ways. It's going to blow your mind, Right? <laughs> All manner of means. There's going to be different ways I'm going to do this. There's going to be different manifestations of my spirit poured out on different people at different times in different ways. Hold on, because here I come. That's what it could mean. So it doesn't necessarily mean all, 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 all. It could mean all. But I know, and experience can't, experience shouldn't define the Bible. Let the Bible define your experience. But I can say this, from our experience, does everybody have the Spirit of God on them or in them? No. <laughs> you can think of someone right now who can't even spell Holy Spirit. So we know from experience that it's not necessarily all. I would say that whosoever is a good usage of that word, good definition of that word. So Jesus tells his followers there in verse 4 and 5, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you this gift. And he explains who the gift is. He says, as I told you before, it's the Holy Spirit that's coming, right? The Holy Spirit, as I told you before. Now I want to I add some credibility to the book of Acts. I want to add some credibility to Jesus Christ by showing you that this, as I told you before, is, is, is specifically documented from his mouth in the Bible, in the Gospel of John. So with your finger in Acts, look in John chapter 14. Two spots I want to show you. John 14, verses 16 and 17. Okay? Just a couple pages back. Tell me when you're there. So what we're doing, we're passing on what I've learned to faithful men and women who will in turn tell others, right? So I'm hoping that you're going to do that. Verse 16, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. There's a star there, depending on your translation. It's the word paraclete, and it can translate advocate, comforter, encourager or counselor these are the roles of the holy spirit of god this is what the holy spirit will do for you okay he will comfort you he will encourage you he will counsel you like give you advice and lead you and he's your advocate right he's actually praying to the father in his perfect will for your life right now awesome awesome so he says, I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. <laughs> Jesus is like... I'm here with you right now, right? So that's why you'll recognize him when he comes because this guy that you're hanging out with right here, right now, that's been teaching you, I'm coming back in the form of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send my spirit down, not to just hang out with you, but to be in you. So you will recognize when I come because you've been hanging out with me. And that's such a good word too. That's when you know when someone gives you a word, Hey, I got a word for the, from the Lord for you. 
you'll know if it's a valid word because you've actually been hanging out with Jesus. And you'll be able to recognize that it's a valid word from the Lord because it should line up with what Jesus Christ has taught you in his word in your daily study. Okay? <clears throat> so you'll recognize him. It's the Holy Spirit that's coming. Okay? And then also, two chapters later, John 16, go there. This is a little bit longer, verses 5 through 15. 16, 5 through 15. He says, but now I am going away to... The, so he's about to die. Jesus is about to go to the cross, right? And these people have kind of decided to follow him, and things are going pretty good. He's performing miracles, got a big group starting, right? He's going around preaching, teaching, people getting raised from the dead, miracles are happening, it's awesome. And all of a sudden he says, but now I'm going away to the one, capitalized, who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. He's like, so instead of talking about the future and where I'm going and what that means, you're just kind of bummed out because I'm going to die. Human thinking. Human thinking, right? We impose our standard and will upon God, and that's not what he wants. Okay, I've got a different plan. But in fact, he says, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, then this advocate that I told you about, if this advocate, this paraclete, this encourager, this comforter, this counselor, if I don't go, he won't come. I can't be with you in the flesh and in the spirit at the same time. I think it would blow your brains apart. So he's like, I got to go. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, here we go, listen, he will convict the world of its sin he will convict the world of God's righteousness, and he will convict the world of the coming judgment. The world's sin, listen, we sin in a whole lot of different ways, don't we? Here's the big one. Here's the one that everyone needs to know. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. That's it. All the rest of the stuff is, 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 is junior varsity compared to that. Okay, if you don't, you, you could you could say you're sorry about everything else, but if you don't have Jesus, you got nothing. You got nothing. Okay, so so it's uh, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness that the Holy Spirit will convict us of that's available because I go to the Father and you'll see me no more. So I'm sending you my Holy Spirit. That's what qualifies you as right righteous, right? Not anything you did. It's because it's I'm leaving and I'm sending my spirit to live in you. <laughs> That's what makes you righteous. And then listen, judgment will come because the rule of this world has already been judged. Okay, judgment's coming. So what I see here, the Holy Spirit's job is to, is to teach you the necessity of your need for Savior. Necessity, and then it's the qualifications of righteousness. It's not of your own. It's because of me. And then urgency, right? You need me. I'm making myself available, and get it now. Get it now. Get it now. And that's what preachers need to be shouting from the pulpit is, you need it now. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Right? Tomorrow might not come. And everyone's like, oh, that's gloom and doom, preacher. But listen, watch the news. Watch the news and see. Listen, we just got past the 9-11 the thing. 3,000 people didn't know. They didn't know that that was their last day urgency judgment is coming make a decision make a decision don't play on the fence don't beat around the bush make a decision that's the job of the holy spirit right so jesus here in the book of acts chapter one he's like listen something big's coming something listen don't leave jerusalem something big is coming right Something big is about to go down. And here it is. Watch. You ready? Let's read on verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, right, he's with them. They're eating. And he says this this one time. And so when the apostles were with Jesus, it wasn't this one time when they were eating with him and he said something specific. It says that when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept on asking him. So this is a repeated thing. They kept asking this. They heard, they heard the one thing that Jesus said about this Holy Spirit that's coming. 
Wait in, wait in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit's going to be poured down on you. And, and so the apostles, it says they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? You know, because they're under the Roman rule, right? No freedom. And so he replies, verse 7, uh, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're not for you to know. Um, none of your business, right? None of your business. Uh, verse 8, but you will receive power. And now, now I can just see him now, because they're thinking, now yeah, you're going to free us? We've got a kingdom coming? You're going to receive power. And like, All right, there's a good part right here, right? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, I can see the wind in their sails just depleting, right? <laughs> Power! Ah! Like Braveheart. And, and they're thinking kingdom and fighting and war and, and, and freedom. And, and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And these guys, it's a little, this is kind of, this is kind of liberating for us too because these guys have been hanging out with Jesus for three years. Not just reading about him. Not just enjoying his spirit, but like physically in his presence. Like he's, he's doing with them what I'm doing with you right now. It just makes you feel like you're getting gypped, doesn't it? Like he's teaching. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is teaching these people day in and day out. And these guys, totally epic miss, right? Totally mistaken. See, they thought that the kingdom of God that, that Jesus spoke of was like all the rest that had come and gone, Right? A worldly kingdom. And, and so, uh, you know, a dude arrives on the scene. He's kind of cool. And, and the people like him. And they kind of get behind him, right? And, and so an army kind of starts to gather. And, and we march. And we, and, we, and we burn some villages. And, and, and kill some kids. And, and steal some land. And boom, we got a kingdom, right? And that's what they're wanting. They want, like all the rest of the kingdoms that have come and gone. They, that, that's what they want. Let's kill the Romans, and Jesus is going to set us free, and we're going to wield the sword, and we're going to be free. That's what they see, right? They love Jesus. They thought he was good. You guys think he's good, right? But here's the thing, and this is <laughs> super convicting for me. I don't, maybe I'm just going to preach to myself now. But, like, I see in these people, I see me. I see that I think that God is good if he does things that I want him to, right? If, if he, listen, God is good, and, and I, listen, this is so embarrassing. Please tell me that you do this, because if I'm alone, I'm quitting. I pray, right? So if someone says, hey, I'm sick, or I, this, right? And I'm like, oh, all right, uh, Kim's sick, and I, so Lord, you know, um, she can't pay her rent, or she's sick, or whatever, or her kid is sick, and so, Lord, you know, would you help, and would you heal, right? And that's good. You want to love on them, and you want to pray for them, right? And so then you start listing off the ways that God could do it. Come on, don't leave me up here, right? If you could just, like, just, just, just let them go out to their mailbox and find that check. And, and, and if you could just have the doctors be able to find what's really wrong with her and give them a good, I start telling God how he should do it, right? Instead of saying, God, I have no, because listen, how many times has God done something you're like, how did he pull that one off, right? Like, what is that? Like, total left field. You're like thinking it's going to come this way, it's going to come this way. And all of a sudden, wham, from right over there. He's like, well, I gotcha, right? And, but yet, no matter how many times this happened to me, I still go through my list of ways God could do it. Like, he needs my, I mean, he's up there going, oh, I never thought of that. That's a good idea. I'm going to do it that way. Like, that, but that, seriously, isn't that what my prayers say to this guy? He's probably laughing at me. Really? You, like, I'm going to help her. You think I'm going to do it that way? You're a numbskull. Just go, go, go. <laughs> so, you know, Mary and Martha, right? Mary and Martha, Mary and Martha, Mary and Martha. They have a brother, Lazarus, right? And, and so they're like, Jesus, will you come? My brother's sick, and he's, he's dead. And they're like, you know, if you had come, he, he, he wouldn't be sick. And Jesus is like, no, his, 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 his sickness is not going to end in death. Don't you believe? And, and, they're, bo and they're like, I think it, was, I think it was, I think both of them said that. But 
he asked them, and they're like, one of them said, they answer back, I can't remember which one. I always get those two confused, don't you? And uh, just say yes, humor me. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so, so, so someone says, yeah, I, I believe that, you know, in the resurrection, he will rise. But, you know, and, and that's true, right? That's good. That's good. God, may, that's one of the reasons why God is good. That even though you die, you're going to live, right? In the resurrection, you're gonna, he's going to come down from heaven with the archangels, trumpet sound, and all of us that have fallen asleep in the Lord will rise and join him in the air and be with him forever. Hallelujah, right? <clears throat> that makes him good. But that's not what Jesus wanted to do. She had no idea. No, I'm going to raise that fool right now. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? So my point is this. Don't let your theology block Jesus from doing something in your life. Right? And listen, hear me, loved ones. I didn't say don't let theology block Jesus from doing something. Because there is a theology that's right. That doesn't mean it's yours. Or mine. Because we're flawed. So don't let your theology block what God wants to do. He's like... If he's good for raising them in the resurrection, he's super good for raising them right there, right? And, but, but they didn't see it. So we're trying to impose what God should do on him. And so that's exactly what these people were doing. They're like, hey, is, so is this the time? Is this the time, Jesus, that you're going to free Israel and we're going to wield the sword and we're going to raise arms and we're going to be free and you're going to conquer and help us? <clears throat> so they keep asking him. Is this the time? Is this the time? And he's like, yeah, don't worry about that, guys. So I think it was, what, 1948, Israel becomes a state. Boy, they'd have been holding their breath for a long time. <laughs> but God had that all orchestrated. He didn't need this. He didn't need this. This wasn't his plan, right? So, so in verse 8, he's like, listen, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But not to wield a sword. You will receive power to be my witnesses. To be my witnesses. The Greek word is martus. It's a judicial term. Think courtroom. Think judges, jury, attorney, witness stand. What is it? It's a witness. It's someone who sees something and then tells what they saw. Right? That's what we are. But you know what's really amazing? It's martus isn't just someone who will see and tell, it's also the word for martyr. You guys know what a martyr is? Someone who's willing to lay down their life for Jesus Christ. Now, many of us may never actually take a bullet or a sword for Jesus. It may come in our lifetime. I don't know. But just think about this for a second. Martus, my witnesses, my disciples... My, not just believers in Christ, my disciples are people who will lay down their life to tell people of me. And that doesn't mean I'm going to die physically to do it. Sometimes we do, in other countries especially. But will I die to myself to do it? Will I, will I take all of my stuff, my desires, my plan, my agenda, my schedule, my comfort, my needs, and lay them aside and make Jesus known my priority? That's what a real disciple does. That is a witness for Jesus Christ. Here's what that looks like. You can turn here if you want to. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not my opinion. It's God's opinion. As a matter of fact, that's no opinion at all. He says it's true. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. You ready? He says this. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, right? He's, he's just a guy, and, and some of us believe that he was the guy that went to the cross to pay for sin, and he was a good teacher, and he was a philosopher, and he was a prophet, and a rabbi, and a carpenter. He was all those things, and, and we knew who he was. How many people knew who Jesus Christ was before they accepted him as Lord and Savior? Anybody? 
right? You knew who he was. You heard about him, right? Everybody's heard about him in America. Even if you don't believe, you've all just kind of heard about him. And so he says, uh, we, at one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. We were all there. Uh, how differently we know him now. Right? How differently we know him now. And so when you become a Christ follower, indwelled with the Holy Spirit, you should think of Jesus as a whole different person. He's not just some dude who went to the cross 2,000 years ago, got whipped and beaten, and he makes good movies about him. No, he's my love. He's my savior. He's my Messiah. He's my everything. He's my provider, right? He's the lifter of my head. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He's the lover of my soul. I think of him totally different now. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, in some translations I like it better, it says, who are in Christ. It's an amazing miracle too, right? That we are in Christ, but yet he says, I'll send my spirit to be in you. How are we both? Can we just all say, I don't know, right? I don't know. It's just what it says. This means that anyone who is in Christ, belongs to Christ, has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Totally different person. The person you were before you embraced Christ as Lord and Savior is supposed to be dead and buried and gone and everything you used to do shouldn't be doing anymore. Stop hanging on to the old things, the old habits, right? Don't do that. The old language, the old places, the old people, the old things. Dead, new person, right? And watch this. All of this is a gift from God. Thank you, Jesus who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us, here's your marching orders, you ready? You came to church tonight to be told what to do. Here it is, here it is, here's your meaning in life. Right here, right here, you ready? And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Okay, now he's going, and we've just learned that he's ascending, right? And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is now making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. Imagine that, you, little old you. Little old you, right? Little old Julia over there. Little old you. You speak for Christ. You speak for the second person of the Trinity. You speak for the one who went to the cross. You speak, you, little old you. He says, we speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. And how many of us are pleading? How many people are out there pleading with people? Come back to God. Or are we just afraid? They might not like us. They might say no. I might get fired. Plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So all this means that to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, to be in Christ, to belong to Christ, means you will put your life aside and give your life over to telling others of Jesus Christ. That's it. <clears throat> Being his disciple is beyond an intellectual knowing, right? That was what we thought of before. Before we knew him from a human perspective. An intellectual knowing of who he was, that doesn't make you a disciple of Christ. And it's beyond uh, an emotional overflow in the moment when I'm feeling something and I do something. No, 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 no. Here's what it really is. It's a lasting influence of God's spirit upon you and you making a decision of your will to make Jesus and his kingdom known and ruling to the ends of the earth. That's what a disciple of Jesus Christ does. So when Jesus makes this bold statement that I shared with you earlier in Matthew 16, 18, that I will build my church and all the powers of hell cannot stop this, 
It's here in the book of Acts that documents this epic launch and spreading in its infancy of this mission that Jesus said he was going on to build his kingdom, to build his church. And this book of Acts, it is filled with, Chalk filled, man. This is the this is the book that every charismatic person that's ever come through this church has been waiting for me to preach, and they left. So sorry. Um, it's filled. <laughs> it's filled with tons of miracles, and also but tons of death, and 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 shipwrecks, and angelic encounters, and 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 persecution, and demons, and riots, and whips, and beating, and church planting, and people being raised from the dead, and filled with sorcerers, all of it. And along the way, we're going to pause at all those places, and we're going to learn from them how we're supposed to live, reflect on all of those things, and learn from them. But all of those things, as awesome as they are, standing alone on their own, they are all awesome. But they're just simply steps and details in a bigger narrative in the book of Acts of Jesus Christ building his church, starting in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. That's the main narrative of the book of Acts. It's not a book about miracles. It's a book about the miracle of Jesus Christ spreading his church to the ends of the earth, right? How, how many people have maps at the, at the back of their Bible? You got maps at the back of your Bible? I like maps. I like GPS now, right? But man, don't you remember when you were a kid? Remember that big old atlas that your dad would have in the car? It was stuck in the door. And it was like the size of the pulpit right here. And you just, I loved maps, right? I loved maps. And uh, so I want to put up a map for you. So this is what Jesus was talking about here. It sa he says that don't leave Jerusalem. Here it is. Sorry about the people on the other side. So here we are, right? Here's Jerusalem. He says, okay, I want you to go right here, and I want you to hang out right here. And I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit upon you guys and then from here, you're going to be my witnesses. What does that mean? That means you're going to faithfully lay down your life to tell what you have seen. Remember what Jesus said in the end of Matthew? He said, now, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So no, go make disciples, right? And teach them all that I've taught you. And so these faithful men, he says, I'm going to pour my spirit out to you. And so you're going to be my witnesses to do just that. You're going to see and tell and lay down your life from here to the, no, 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 back to this whole area, not just in your hometown, right? In the area that it's in, and then to Samaria, so beyond the area that it's in, and then what? To the ends of the earth, everywhere, right? And listen, listen, loved ones, you got to change your mindset. See, a lot of us see a room that's empty, and I do too sometimes, but you got to be thinking about this. These people, of which there was less of them than are in this room right now, were to influence people from across the globe. And you have to think that before God will use you for that. That's what God wants to do. He wants to reach the people where we live. So think Leesburg. That's our Jerusalem, right? And then Judea. What's that? Lake County? And then what? Beyond that, Samaria, right? Florida, maybe? And then what? To the ends of the earth. Everywhere. Everywhere, right? So, if you like, do you like maps? I like maps. You know what's better than that map? A moving map. Check this thing out. Check out this map right here. Show this. Watch this. Get some volume. Gives it effect. More epic.
impressive, right? Crazy. Crazy impressive. What's impressive is to watch that this promise of this one man, Jesus Christ, he made a single promise to 12 regular dudes over 2,000 years ago in a place that's 6,500 miles away from here, and somehow it becomes a worldwide reality. That blows my mind, and it should blow yours too. What's impressive also is to see, I thought this was cool, to see all these other religions and empires sprout up, right? Powerful entities, powerful kings, powerful empires, powerful um, nations. Look, communism, boom, right? They all rise, and then they fall. As Jesus Christ, right, and his kingdom just steadily spreading across the world as faithful witnesses give their life over to making Jesus known to the ends of the earth. I don't know. I don't know how to trace each of you back to the Jerusalem. I don't know how that all happened. We all have our story, right, of how we got saved, how we heard, how we knew. And I can't trace those things back. But I know this. I know this is true, that a faithful witness in Jerusalem opened their mouth and somebody heard and they believed. And when they believed, they made the decision like the person who told them that I'm going to be a faithful witness and I'm going to tell someone and that person told somebody. And the chain continued and it continued and you watched it and it continued and continued and continued until it moved the gospel right here to America where somewhere along the line a faithful witness of Jesus Christ opened their mouth to you and you believed and were saved. Praise God. And so maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here today and I'm the witness that is speaking and opening my mouth and all of a sudden, something's happening to you, and you feel yourself feeling something you never felt before. And all of a sudden, you feel like, hey, man, I can't believe this. I'm in awe of what Jesus said and who he is, and, 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 and I'm starting to believe. Like, I, I don't know where this is coming from. And maybe you find yourself believing that Jesus Christ died to pay for your sins. And maybe you feel like maybe he did die so that I could be saved and so that I could be assured a residence in heaven with Jesus for all eternity. I could just say that you don't need to do anything fancy. You don't need to rush the aisle. You don't need to rush the altar. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to fill out any card. That's all you need to do. Nothing fancy. Just let them know in prayer. Let them know how you feel. Let them know what you think. Let them know what you choose. That now Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Now listen up, listen up, okay? <clears throat> if you just became a Christian right then and there and you started believing and you made a decision, or maybe you made a decision 40 years ago, I don't know where you are on that timeline, but if that's you, I want to talk to you. <clears throat> don't be fooled, not yet. Don't be fooled, not even close. I ain't even, we're just getting warmed up. Don't be fooled by what you saw on the map. See all that tan that was up there where Christianity was spreading? That means that there are Christians there. That means that the gospel made it there. There are Christians in those tan areas, praise God. But listen, loved ones, right now as we sit there, two-thirds of the world have either not heard or they've heard and not made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. And that means that the promise of Jesus Christ to build his church is still valid and underway today, which beckons this question for you. Will you make a choice to continue the chain that started in Jerusalem and made its way to you? 
Will you choose today to be a faithful witness for Jesus? Will you lay aside your life and give your life over to making Jesus Christ known and his kingdom reign to the ends of the earth? That's what the book of Acts is all about. And that's what we're here for tonight. That's what tonight's all about. If you will make that choice. See, at the beginning I shared with you that were Jesus, we're, they were watching as Jesus took off to heaven, right? And they said, these two angels show up and say, hey, listen, what are you looking for? He's gone. But someday he's going to be back. And we're stuck living in that gap right now. That's where we live. In the gap between him leaving and him coming back, that's where we are right now. So if you're, a, if you're a believer in Christ, but you want to make a quality choice tonight, once and for all, to transition from a believer of thinking him with your mind, knowing him on a human level only, and you want to transition to becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then listen, you have been empowered from upon high. If you are a Christian, then you've been empowered from upon high. There's no waiting. There's no waiting for some Pentecost thing to come and the winds of Pentecost and the tongues of Pentecost come flying through the room. Listen, Ephesians 1.13 says that when you believed Christ gave you his Holy Spirit, you have been empowered from upon high. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. The same spirit that hovered over the nothing before Christ spoke creation into existence. The same spirit that inspired men to write the word of God. The same spirit that convicts the world of sin. The same spirit that convicts the world of God's righteousness and his judgment. That spirit lives inside of you. You have been empowered from upon high. And what does a spirit-filled follower of Jesus Christ supposed to be? A witness, a witness of Jesus Christ. Now we're done. <laughs> so listen, listen, listen up. Our time is fleeting. How many of us in this room feel old right now? Okay? Our time is fleeting. And our task is huge. Massive. Ends of the earth, massive. Two-thirds of the earth, if they were to perish, if Christ were to come back today and split those clouds, two-thirds of the earth would plummet into a godless eternity. And he's given us the task of reconciling them back. That we plead, we speak for God when we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. That's our job. And over the next year or so, we're going to just examine the chapters that have come before us, all the while determining how we will write the chapter about us. Okay? You've been given a task. Choose to be a part of it. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of your spiritual army to go and conquer, to push back darkness, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, you've planted us here in Leesburg and somehow, some way, in your sovereignty, you, you saw fit to get the gospel to us. I'm saved personally, Lord, today because faithful witnesses opened their mouth, laid down their life to make you known. And today I stand in that grace. And I thank you for that. And if there's anyone in this room that has received that grace oh be thankful Lord there are things that will war with us right now that will say oh 
that's just too much and it doesn't require all of that and he's just a Jesus freak and not everyone's there we all grow at our own speed and all these different voices will pop up but the voice of God says give yourself as a living sacrifice for it is that sacrifice that is pleasing to God in reasonable worship so Lord help us appreciate what you've done help us to acknowledge the chain that has brought the good news to our own life and help us heaven help us to make the choice to be part of the chain that continues to share the gospel to a lost and hurting needing world we want to be your disciples here Lord Jesus we want to be your disciples so Lord I pray that I have been to the best of my ability by your grace a faithful witness of you tonight and you said to pass on what we know to faithful men and women who will in turn tell others the same and I pray God that you will empower us to do just that in Jesus name now loved ones we're going to receive our offering and this is all part of it it's not a separate issue it's all part of it. We're to be faithful witnesses, laying our life down to move the gospel to Leesburg, to Lake County, to Florida, to the ends of the earth. Some of your offering goes to fund our compassion kids in Africa. That's the ends of the earth for us. Some of your money goes to buying coffee and creamers to the people who come into the, your church day in and day out to just be served by us with an opportunity to maybe share the gospel with them when they come in, to pray with them. That's what you're doing when you give. And you're providing this space through your giving. You're providing our Facebook broadcast that right now people are watching to hear this. That's what you're, you're, you're advancing a kingdom, loved ones. That's what you're giving to. So there's a very practical sense of what love should look like. So, so just pray for a moment. Just take a moment and just pray and ask the Lord to tell you what you should do when it comes to giving.